Hello, hello. Uh, I'm Seven Investing Lead Advisor, Anubad Mahanti, and it is my pleasure today to have Farza, Farzad Meshabli. Um, we we found Farzad uh, through Twitter uh, because, you know, Seven Investing put out a message saying, you know, who should we bring on into our, our podcast? Who should we interview? And, uh, you know, Farzad was, was, was a suggestion and he's, you know, he's well known in the YouTube community. He's well known on the Twitter community uh, and he's well known for those people who have been following Tesla uh, for a while. So, you know, and I was suggested as the person to host this interview. So that's been my pleasure to do that. And, and it's, it's actually I thank Farzad for agreeing to come on the show. So Farzad has a, has a, he has a wide background. So he's, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, he has a BI background. He's actually an ex-Tesla employee. He spent several years working at Tesla and has been an EV advocate uh, for a long, long time. So Farzad, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Anurban. I'm super excited to be on here uh, and I'm excited to chat with you about whatever you have. So I'm, I'm here for you. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. So, so for our listeners, we, we don't really have a script. And I just before the uh, you know just recording this, I told Farzad, oh, these are things we're going to talk about. So we're going to we're try to jam as as we go on, and I find that that sort of brings out the best uh, opportunity. So the the first thing I want to ask uh, you is to tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, I, I did a two line intro, but I, you know you'll make it more interesting, I'm sure. Uh, and and that, that's just for our listeners to know a little bit about you, maybe where they can find what you're doing today. Uh, I saw that you're actually even jamming um, uh, <laughs> online. You shared some videos, so maybe some people are interested in that, and they might be also <laughs> interested in following that. Over oh, to you. thank you, man. Yeah, thank you, dude. I really appreciate you uh, calling out the music stuff. I uh, so yeah, I uh, I'm a former Tesla employee. I worked there for from 2017 to 2021, uh, July 2017 to September 2021, for exact sort of periods. That's how I'm most known for on the online community. I started a YouTube channel about eight nine months ago that really talked about my time at the company and sort of the things that I've learned about Tesla. Uh, before that, um, I was at a, a pet food distributor for seven years called Philips Pet Food and supplies uh ended my career there as a director of bi and pricing and so a lot of my sort of experience comes from the data side and strategy and things like that uh, that are really related to a growing out of business uh yeah i've been an investor in tesla since 2012 so i caught that train uh, relatively early uh in you know especially if you compare it to some of the other investors that have come in a little bit later um but i've been following this story for a long time like you said an ev advocate so you know i do think that there's a lot of uh, opportunities there to grow that market and um yeah i have a youtube channel if you just search for my name farzad misbahi that will come up right there same thing on twitter if you just search for my name i will come up there as well and then uh, we just started a band uh, a few weeks ago here in austin i just relocated to austin a couple of years ago and back before my life got crazy with all the career stuff i used to play a lot of guitar and ever since i left the company uh ever since i left tesla in, in september to really pursue my passions after i gained some financial independence i really made it a point to play a lot more guitar and we just started a band it's named chat city we have a <laughs> we have a youtube channel for it if you're interested uh we played our first gig on saturday but yeah just uh, i think i'm just on a, on a on a journey right now to really um uh, follow my passions and to really uh, really, every single day when I wake up, I want to work on things that I want to work on. And right now, the YouTube channel, sort of talking about Tesla, the thesis behind Tesla, all the positive things that can come out of moving to a sustainable future, and all those things have become, you know, passions of mine. And now that I have a platform to share my ideas and involve others to come in and also sort of, you know, talk talk a little bit about what the implications are, not just from an investment perspective, but from a cultural perspective, that's been super fun. And I'm, I'm very happy to sit down and talk to you about that stuff today. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Ashley, for that introduction and really thorough. Um, you you hit the nail. You know, we're going to talk about Tesla, a lot of Tesla today. And uh, you're you're an early investor, right? So, I mean, you started in 2012. This was a, a sub $10 billion company then. This is, you know, one of the, you know, uh, ultra mega caps today. Um, and, and a lot of people think, you know, um, a lot of the gains have been had. Uh, you know, maybe it's overvalued and things like that, right? So you, can you unpack for our listeners what your thesis is? Um, you know, it's when you continue to hold, like, you know, I'm a shareholder. I've been a shareholder for a long, long time. Um, the only portions I, I sold, <clears throat> uh, 
um, uh, is uh, is to pay down some, uh, um, you know, um, a down payment for a house. But you know, otherwise, uh, you know, at one point I had a ridiculously very high allocation of roughly forty percent to Tesla. It was just irresponsible, probably. Uh, but you know, it was all it was all basically from the growth of the shares, you know, over time. So I'm just curious to hear what your thesis is, and you know, assuming you're holding now, what what do you see in the future? Yeah, great question. So uh, I, I'm the same way. I, I, in a, uh, almost a very unadvisable percentage of my net worth is still in Tesla to this day. Uh, it, I, I have reduced it a little bit over time, but it hasn't really shifted much. It may have gone from like 50 to 40% or something like that. And uh, a lot, you know, a lot of the, the reason why I use that uh, sort of uh, proceeds from that was again, to like invest it in like real estate and other things. So I'm still a, a very huge, uh, a significant portion of my net worth is in the company. And so the way I think about sort of the, the the thesis of Tesla moving forward, you know, you kind of prefaced it and said, you know, the last 10 years, uh, preface that you said the last 10 years have been, um, there's been a lot of growth. It's gone from a 10 billion to almost a trillion dollar company now from a market ca cap perspective. And so what people think about in their heads, is like, wow, it had such a crazy valuation increase already. There's no way, you know, there's no way that it's going to go any higher. It's gone up too fast. And so... Uh, with the background that I have, the fact that I've been following the company for 10 years, worked at it for f a little over four years, uh, and, I, and I feel very plugged into the community and sort of what Tesla's trying to do, I really do think that the next uh, 10 years are going to be probably an order of magnitude bigger than the last uh, uh, 10. And the way I think about that is uh, the, the future implications of the technologies that Tesla's working on that right now uh, the public doesn't believe are reality. And so... Uh, and then the the uh, addition to that is the expertise that Tesla has that I think folks are still not valuing properly for the company. So let me start there first. So what I mean by that is really scale. So Tesla, in my opinion, is really the only company right now that's in the EV space that has the capability to scale to 10 million, 20 million cars a year based on the current supply chain that's set up for the company. So if you really think about what is the company trying to do, what is the company constantly talking about uh, day in and day out, is how many batteries can we make so that we can sell as many cars as humanly possible? So that's, that's point number one. They're really working on supply. Point number two, the demand, the demand that is out there for the company is 100% organic. It's in a gigantic backlog right now. And Tesla has used essentially zero levers to create that demand, right? So it's, it's you know, they don't market. They, they don't really go out of their way to really push the product. Everything's word of mouth. And all the demand is stemming from just people seeing the cars on the road, saying that looks like a cool car. Then they hear a friend that has a Tesla. The friend's like, yo, get in my car. Let's check out how cool this thing is. The person gets in the car. They're like, okay, I'm going on my phone and ordering one right now. So that's typically how Teslas are sold. And you compare that to any other car company that is very, very different. These car companies or you know, who, whoever else is in that industry, they have budgets that are allocated to marketing and going out there and actually trying to convince you why you should buy their product. So the product is the king for, the, for this car company. And so if it continues in that trajectory, which I think it will, then you have a formula that basically says that this company could have a recipe for essentially unlimited demand until they reach a saturation point, which in this case would be the entire car industry. Now, I'm not saying they're going to have 100% market share, but that's how I think about its potential until somebody comes along that matches that type of uh, approach when it comes to selling vehicles. Um, in addition to those two things, having worked at the company, um, uh, I got an exclusive look into how the company actually runs day in and day out. I can I saw the culture. I saw the problem solving capabilities of the company. I saw the talent. I saw how uh, uh, vertically integrated the company was. And the thing that my biggest takeaway from that, and honestly, for me, it's probably going to be the, the biggest variable as to why I think Tesla right now is positioned to be uh, really the, 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 the perfect company to take advantage of, uh, to really be able to scale into the future, is that culture of innovation and speed and change exists everywhere in the company. And it's so embedded into how everybody works that it was truly eye-opening. It was almost like a new way of running a company. Uh, you have essentially the best talent in the world that has joined the company uh, in the last decade. Tesla and SpaceX are continually ranked number one and two for attracting the best uh, engineering talent. And what the company does is that it empowers these employees 
by essentially giving them a key to run the business. And, you know, it, you, it's not really hierarchical. There's very little, if any, politics. So you essentially have 100,000 people that work at the company that are empowered to go out there and make the right decisions and move the company forward. Oh, and by the way, every single one of these employees also has stock in the company. They're, they're, they're compensated by being invested in the company. And so that already gives them an incentive to try and do as best as possible because that will increase the value of the company, which increases their net worth. So you have this perfect sort of setup for employees to really be incentivized to do the right thing. And again, when you have the smartest people there and the company understands that if we empower them, they'll make the best decisions for the company, then you have another recipe for success. And I saw that with my own two eyes while I was there. Uh, so that's that's a today thing. That's why I think today Tesla is super, super good. And so when you think about the future and how it gets to 10 trillion, who knows, 100 trillion market cap, I don't want to throw out crazy numbers out there, but the, the variable of full self-driving and self-driving cars and AGI and robotics these are things that are still foreign to people. People still don't, don't truly understand, especially call it the, um, uh, you know, the masses, the, the whatever, uh, Main Street. The mainstream doesn't understand that to this day. They've heard of self-driving cars. They've heard of Waymo. They've heard of this autopilot thing. But really, the, the idea of full self-driving technology taking hold, I would argue, is still super not well understood and not well accepted because there's still that sort of uh, separation of people having experienced the technology. So what's happening this year, what I've noticed with Tesla, is that they're really making uh, some pretty significant uh, improvements on their technology from a full self-driving perspective, where they're getting better. Basically, every single month, they have a release that, that comes out and improves the car in, in some measurable way. And so at some point, given Tesla's track record of being able to execute at a very high level, in other words, anything that Tesla really starts and says they're going to work on, they get done. They're never on time, but they get it done. That sets the stage for a full self-driving, say level four or level five autonomy, uh, to exist, say within the next six to six months to twelve years or two years. I really think that's really the time I would think about. And then once that uh, autonomy, uh, that uh, technology exists, then you have a recipe for uh, such incredible profitability. <laughs> you know, you think about what the self-driving means to the company. If you're selling right now, the software is twelve thousand dollars, which is essentially one hundred percent margin. If you do have the utility of a car that can drive itself, and you can rent it out, and other people can use to move around, you essentially have a chauffeur that's driving this car twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. And if you use a simple math of saying you have a chauffeur running around at thirty bucks an hour, eighteen hours a day, three hundred sixty-five uh, days a year, and you rent that service out, that's about two hundred thousand dollars a year if the car were to run eighteen hours a day. So even if you say it's 50% of that, that's still $100,000 a year that you add to the value of the car. And then you can kind of see how these numbers get insane, especially when you have a scalability to get to 20 million cars, blah, 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 blah. So that's that's my thesis. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's very <laughs> long-winded and, and deep. And there's a lot in there, I'm sure, to unpack. But these are things that I've thought about quite a bit. And um, it, it's a combination of what we know exists now and what the future potential of the company is. But given the track record and the execution level of the company in the past, I'm convinced, I'm not, I shouldn't say convinced, I'm highly confident that these things will come to fruition. And we haven't even talked about the bot and AGI, but uh, that's how I think about the company. Yeah. Fantastic. So, okay, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to unpack some of that. So like, let's say uh, Tesla, uh, so Elon Musk says about 20 million by 2030 is I think was, was sort of the goal, right? I think 2030, 20 million. Um, and that that's where the fifty percent compounded growth uh, for yeah. um, uh, for production comes into play, but but let's say you do even fifteen million, that puts them at sort of at the level of a Volkswagen, uh, I guess Volkswagen and Toyota in terms of total output. So it's not that they have hundred percent of the market even at that point, right? Uh, I, I think just people I think have a hard time seeing how how Tesla gets there. I guess there are a couple of different things here. I mean, they have clearly on on a, on a price point basis been able to sell a lot more of these higher price vehicles uh, to consumers versus when you compare with what Toyota or a Honda uh, or Volkswagen needs to do. Volkswagen needs to make the Golf to actually make those numbers. Tesla sure. is not making a Golf equivalent yet. But I guess there is the total cost of ownership into the equation as well, which brings a lot of cost parity um, in, into play. Um, and so I guess one of the things I think about is uh, Tesla in many ways runs like an Apple-like model, right? I mean, it has got a small set of 
uh, products that you can buy at a very small uh, iterations in terms of, or uh, differentiations, right? I mean, you buy a Model 3, all Model 3s are basically identical except for maybe a little bit different on the interior and the battery pack, right? Mm. Um, speed, right? Or faster. At speed, yeah. So, yeah, so dual motor, single motor, you know, is it a bigger battery and things like that. But it's, it's a pretty simple structure. Do you think uh, a Tesla would need to produce other models to actually get to the 20 million uh, oh, yeah. number? I mean, if, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. They'll need to release the Cybertruck. You know, that's that might add, say, super optimistically, half a million to a million units a year, maybe a million and a half, but you still have a gap there, right? <laughs> so I, I do think the total addressable market that Tesla has built right now with Model 3, Y, S, and X is probably close to 4 million. If they had the capacity for 4 million cars right now between those four, I really do think they would sell 4 million cars right now. And if you layer in okay. Cybertruck, that's another million. So let's say, let's say right now with Cybertruck next year and everything they have right now, if every single factory that they need to ramp up the supply to meet demand, given their current strategy of doing zero marketing and advertising, I think it's four million, five million cars a year. Excuse me. So you need 50 right. million to get there, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's van, smaller vehicle, um, semi that's you know semi right so so there are some ones but really the smaller vehicle is the big one is is that it's, sort it's of like yeah. $25,000 car but but here's my point about the scalability what other company is going to have the supply chain and really the the capacity and the expertise built out in this technology which is batteries to be able to generate enough batteries at a super cost competitive level that's going to be able to allow them to get to 5 to 20 million cars a year if you take a Volkswagen or a GM or a Ford as an example these companies, their entire supply chains and the entire capacity is built on an old technology, and they're not really compatible with an EV technology. There's a reason why Ford is losing money on the Mustang EV, uh, Mach-E, when they were selling it before the crazy inflation went up. There's a reason why they were losing money on that. And so and the question becomes... <laughs> And exactly. Not scale. They don't have enough exactly. scale. Exactly. Yeah. They don't yeah. have it. That's what it really comes yeah. down to is that is that yes, they're not gonna be they're not 20 million yet, but the only one that can get to 20 million EVs per year is Tesla because they actually have the foundation and the capability and the expertise to get there. And so and so I, I really think the way investors should be looking at this is not that Volkswagen and Toyota are making 10 million cars a year, is who is making the most EVs right now. Because that's really mm -hmm. what the product is. The, the internal that, combustion right. engine is broken. It, that, that is yeah, no that's, longer that's a, a sunk cost. Exactly. They and it's not compatible. Cost. Yeah. 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 So one of the things I think a lot of investors initially thought, and I think that has now been thoroughly debunked, which is what, you, what you're talking about here, is that, you know, the, the old guard knows how to make, knows how to, they have the factories, they can scale very easily. But what turns out to be the case is those factories actually make ICE vehicles or ICE because they can actually make the EVs and the supply chain for EVs works differently. And if you want to optimize that further, like, you know, you want to do giga casting and things like that, you know, you know, you probably make the, the cheaper vehicle just in a single cast, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, and and, you're, and you're, you're making, you're getting the experience along the way. And, and maybe you use exoskeleton because, you know, exoskeleton is going to make it even cheaper. We don't know, but maybe those are the things that, those are the advances in manufacturing technologies that are going to enable that. And of course, a smaller vehicle requires a smaller amount of battery. Um, so the company with the biggest amount of battery supply and battery production facility and whether it is the new type of cells that they're working on uh, clearly has an advantage over any others. And, and, and I think that that is beyond that. But I wanted to just get your thoughts on uh, sure. on uh, the, the, the smaller vehicles, you know, because I bet there's going to be, there has to be something that's hidden somewhere <laughs> that, that's going to be. be. Uh, there has to be. Um, but I want to touch upon something else. I think I think you hit it, uh, you know, you're right on here uh, on the money. When you're saying, I think that ex with self-driving and maybe even with the things like, you know, um, the robot uh, and uh, the stuff they're doing with, um, you know, Dojo, a lot of those things are, at that stage, where, you know, they're at the 2010 stage where people think, ah, oh, this is, you know, this is, this is a sideshow, this is a gimmick, or this is just a it. passion project. And, and, and Tesla's ability to execute exactly as you pointed out, you know, I don't, I, everything that they say that they're going to do, they have done, 
it might be late by a couple of years, but you know, the promise big and you're delivering a couple of years, being a couple of years late actually is not a big deal. Right. Um, how do you think about uh, Karpathy leaving? So I have a couple of different thoughts. I'll share my thoughts and I'll let you then uh, debunk my thought. So sure. one of the things I think about, uh, when I think about the FSD suite, so they had uh, Jim Keller, for example, work on the hardware uh, component. He came, he designed, he left. Uh, Jim Keller has has a history of doing that <laughs> with different companies. He has, you know, he has been at very you know different companies, helped them, and he, he's I think a you know a builder who builds these crazy new things and then moves on to build the next crazy new thing he can build. Um, and, and so he left. And a lot of other people, a lot of significant people have come in and left, and Tesla's FSD has continued to evolve over time. So that's one aspect to say that you know Karpathy leaving is not a big deal. Um, at the 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 counter argument that is often made is if FSD is that close to being done, it's kind of foolish to be uh, to leave, you know, before peak fame, <laughs> uh, right? And you know, a smart person is not going to be. So maybe the timeline actually is not six months or two years, but maybe it's five years to get done. And uh, that's a long time for a young, you know, young successful individual, and maybe you know, and, and as you said, they've, they've gotten a lot of stock over the last five years, and they're, therefore they're also wealthy, and maybe, you know, wants to pursue academic interests, and therefore wants to go back to academia. Um, it remains to be seen, you know, whether Tesla, for example, if he goes back to academia, does a Tesla chair or something like that, an arrangement where they actually work with him, because they've done that in the past, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, for example, a battery group in, in Dalhousie. Um, uh, right. So I'm just wondering what, how, how do you think about, I think mean, this is the most significant departure, uh, you know, Andreas Karpathy's departure. You know, I used to call mm -hmm. him sort of the god of, uh, uh, in the computer vision, world and having that talent mm -hmm. leave is a, is a significant thing. How, how do you uh, look at that versus say, the progress of FSD uh, that uh, the Tesla has made, especially with FSD beta? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So I I agree with you 100% that Carpathia leaving is definitely a big loss to Tesla, 100%. If, if it wasn't a big loss to Tesla, then he wasn't the right talent to be at that helm, right? So that's kind of the way I think about it. So yes. good good people leave all the time, right? So, but the way I view his contribution is the one thing to keep in mind with Karpathy is that, um, and I'm not an AI expert, but from what I know of what his background is that he is vision, he is vision, He's, his expertise is vision. Uh, so my, my, uh, my alternate uh, thesis to this would be that I think his piece of the puzzle has been solved. And now it's just a lot of computational sort of, um, AI work that has to go in to take the vision data set that has that has been collected through the cameras that's being fed into Dojo or whatever systems they have. And then that work that goes in there has to be done by a different team, which doesn't really uh, encompass what Andre's expertise is necessarily. And so they're almost hitting the next generation of full self-driving development, right? So that would be one counter that, that I would say. I don't know if I'm right. I'm just you know, it's a hypothesis. I'm just, I'm just saying that, but really what it, I think what it truly comes down to is that I think, I think Andre, like I, I was there for a little over four years. It feels like you worked there for 12. Like it feels like you've been somewhere for 12. It, there's a huge, like uh compounding factor when you work at a company that moves so fast on relentlessly for like, it's just on, it, it does not let up. So you go hard every single minute that you're there. And I still to this day, I don't know how Elon can do it for, I don't know, it feels like 15, 20 years, however long he's been there, superhuman ability. So, and I think different people just have different sort of limitations of how long they want to be in that environment. That That's one variable. The other one is passions. Passions change. You know, who knows what, you know, Andre maybe is like, I, I want to do something a little bit differently. Um, but ultimately, I think what it comes down to is Tesla can hire the best talent. So even if Andre leaves, I think that opens up the door for somebody even better to come in and take over. So think about JB Straubel. So JB Straubel was the one of the founders of Tesla and he left around I think 2017 2018 in the middle of the Model 3 ramp, which he was a crucial piece to get going because he was the battery guy and Gigafactory Nevada was his thing. And he left right as they were ramping up and then when when he left what happened? The company ramped, right? So that's sort of the parallel I would draw to that is that Andre leaving could very well signal that his work is done. 
And now he's going to go to the next stage of the thing. And it's just a matter of time. Just get the data in there and get it going. And then the next generation of leadership that comes in in his shoes is going to take the company to the next level. Uh, and this is what Drew did when JB Strubble left is Drew is now taking the company to the next level from a scaling perspective. So, but again, it, it's, just, it's just an hypothesis, but I tend to view it that way because it's, it's, uh, I know what kind of talent Tesla can bring in. And, and there's, there's never going to be a gap. They'll find who they need. They'll find who yeah, they need. I, I think I agree with that. So one of the things I think about great leadership, so great leadership is not about just being great yourself, right? Because you alone cannot carry an entire movement, right? Everyone has um, to be so better than you. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to be training people to replace you. I, I, you know, I, you know, in my in, in my one of my previous jobs, I used to say that you know I've done my job well. If I can leave and you can replace me immediately, because that means exactly. I've done my job well, right? Not that oh he, this person is leaving, we need to keep this person at any cost. Um, you know that that actually is that's so, a red so, flag. Did, did, yeah, that's a red flag. That basically is basically building fiefdoms, and uh, and that is actually very bad for a company that creates politics, that creates power plays. So I think the JB Struggle example is a fantastic one because you know he had trained um, uh, Drew Baligno, um, and or I get the pronunciation, and, and he just, he's you know he's nicely stepped up and, and taken up that role. Um, I hear that uh, the the AI team or the FSD team is 120 engineers strong, so. Uh, enough, enough numbers. Yes, big loss. I agree, but I think you know, in in, in a true Tesla way, that should be easy to, uh, easy to fulfill. Okay, I want to jump. You know, um, I guess. Okay, one more thing I want to talk about. I think this is, uh, and I want to get your view on this. I think one of the things that people. So if, when I look, I look at a lot of earnings, as an investor, uh, and what, one of the things that surprises me is that you know, uh, Tesla has got positive free cash flow. It, it generates yeah. it, plenty of free cash flow. People just don't realize it has the highest, uh, you know, operating margins in the industry that is actually increasing at a crazy pace. So this company is actually going to be printing and uh, cash at record numbers as it continues scaling up. And it's probably not going to know what to do with that cash. Yeah. Um, so, so that's one of the things, you know, you could actually, this is a company where you can actually do a DCF model and see, well, what does the market forecasting for free cash flow growth? And, and my yeah. thesis has always been that, oh, they, they, they're underballing what the free cash flow growth is going to be for this company. But uh, let's, let's put that aside uh, and, uh, Let's think about a little bit about the risk, right? What do you think are the biggest impediments to, you know, uh, Tesla, you know, being, you know, say double or triple or quadruple from here and, and continuing to, you know, win market share, continuing to, you know, print that free cash flow. What are, the, what are the sort of the big risks that you see that the company has that are still, you know, um, it hasn't yet addressed. I think, you know, it, the factory was a big one. I think that's being rapidly addressed right now with, with the multiple factories. But I'm just wondering, what are the other big risks that you see? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I view Tesla's risks as 100% uh, macro related. I don't really, I, I really do believe that Tesla, uh, when it comes to massive risks that could, well, let, let me rephrase that. I think I think the biggest risk for Tesla's future growth is uh, lack of uh, visibility into how they get to 20 million. Like we don't know how they get to 20 million to this point. Like they're talking about 20 million, but they're they haven't really shown their cards. Now you can make an argument that the reason why they haven't is because they still have two years yet to go of their internal, like the actual production capacity they have right now. Once everything's fully ramped up between four factories, each of them can probably do a million cars a year. Realistically, that gets you to four million. That's four X where we are now. So the whole thing is like, why the hell do we need to tell you what we're doing when we've already we have four X to go? Like, give us a year. Like, we'll get there. But if we don't hear that, say. In the next six months, six to 12 months, then that's one potential risk, especially to the stock price, is that investors don't see visibility into maybe 10, even 10 million cars, let alone 20. How do you get to 10 million? Because a lot of the assumptions is, hey, like a lot of your a lot of your stock price is based on you continuing to perform perfectly. I'm not really sure that's the case, but that's sort of the narrative. So we'll go with that. Uh, but, you know, tell us how you're going to get there. So that that's 
let's label that one risk is lack of visibility into 10 million, 20 million with the assumption that the stock price performance is tied to that figure. So let's use that as one risk factor. So can, can, this, can I go, yeah. uh, can I just inter- jump in a bit here? Yes, um, please. And so, sorry, for, sorry for cutting you off, uh, your no, thought process, but uh, hold on to your thought. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things though, like, I mean, if we think about the Model 3, the Model 3 has sold way more than a comparable model in that sedan class would be, right? Yes. You know, entry-level luxury, whatever you want to call it, right? I would say that the Model Y would easily sell twice, maybe thrice of that, because that sort Agreed. of vehicle um, is, is just priced. It's the perfect utilitarian vehicle at that price range, right? And, and they always have some price levers to, that they can pull as their battery technology improves, they, you know, they could be pulling some price levers as well. Uh, these cars have got good margin. We know that. Um, so it, in my mind, it seems to be that, you know, they put a couple more factories and they've become very CapEx efficient, right? So they're, they're projecting, what, $6 billion to $8 billion CapEx spend, uh, I think, annually over the next few years based on the last, the last 10Q. Um, so if they put a couple more factories, you know, and the factories are becoming more efficient, so, you know, that gets us to $10 million. I think I can see the roadmap to $10 million uh, with maybe if they, you know, get the cyber truck, and again, we're we're probably underestimating how popular the cyber truck could be, right? I agree. Um, so uh, the cyber truck could be this, you know, it is the the vehicle that the tradies use, and it's a vehicle the recreation folks use, and then the, you know, all of a sudden you've got a much larger market um, opportunity, right? And we have to remember that uh, what the Ford F one fifty, like you know, it's the it's the highest selling vehicle for Ford, right? So there's no reason to believe that Tesla can't do that much <laughs> as, a, as an example. So I think the 10 million roadmap I see, but even with 10 million, don't you think they have plenty free cash flow though? Like, I mean, 10 million would generate- percent. Yeah, it, it's right? not a free cash flow question. It's just like, it, it goes back to the point of, of, of people, like people I don't think are still seeing this clearly. Like they don't, they don't right. like for okay. some reason, Q3 and Q4 is they're gonna generate so much cash, it's gonna be laughable. They're going to make mm-hmm. so much money here in the next two quarters. It's going to be laughable, right? So I, I'm talking more about like like the deployment of that cash so that investors know that they're going to be able to get to 10 million because they haven't been like, quote unquote, as clear as they should be about getting to 10 or 20 million because Elon is throwing out the 20 million car number out there by 2030. But they're like, well, you only have four factories and it looks like you're only doing half a million per. That's 2 million. But there's not enough layers for those people mm. to understand. So, and I'm just purely talking about like what I think the market's perceiving from the company and, and stock performance. You and I, I think both agree that they have well over 4 million capacity built in right now in these four factories. And to your point, they deploy what, $4 billion of cash and they have, uh, I don't know, they may, may be able to get to six or 8 bi- uh, million cars per year, especially if they introduce a, a cheaper model, which is going to be way cheaper to build. There's going to be smaller, less parts. You can get a lot more throughput, right? So you can layer all these things uh, down. Um, Right. So yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. It's just I, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of like say uh, like an investor that doesn't understand that story because it's such mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. it's such a weird story. If you really think about it, what other automaker can can spend two billion dollars and and build a million cars? Nobody. They have to Nobody. spend ten Nobody. billion dollars and they make half a million cars. This is a insane story that's still not well understood, right? Um, right? Now, you would think with Austin and Berlin ramping that that would become clearer, but I don't think that really becomes a, a something that the market truly understands until those facilities are fully ramped up. So this will probably be like a middle of 2023. So maybe when we fast forward the conversation to that date and we come back to this, you know, then we can say, yep, everybody understands what's going on now. So now the risk becomes a different conversation. Maybe, oh, there isn't enough uh, raw materials. Maybe there's some conflict Mm -hmm. in in the macro environment, right? So that was sort of my second thing was uh, some of the instability in the macro environment, especially with the Russia-Ukraine thing and the China-Taiwan thing. And you got more uh, deglobalization sort of happening on on planet Earth a little bit right now. And what are the complexities that 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 brings to to a supply chain? So that 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 is a factor. That is a risk factor. But that's not really a Tesla mis- misexecution. It's just a changing world, and that Tesla wouldn't be the only one that suffers from this. It would be everybody, right? It would be mm-hmm. everybody suffers from that risk. So, uh, and that to me is like one A, one B, one C, one D, one E, two A, and two A and two B risk, right? And then somewhere mm-hmm. in like four or five is the thing that I brought up first, which is hey, like right. I don't know how yeah. you're going to get to twenty million, you know.
Yeah, so the macroeconomic, I mean, if uh, again, looking at results, you know, Apple uh, grew by 2%, uh, Amazon, I think, went backwards, or like 6 7%. Uh, Google did, what, 13%. Tesla did, what, 40% growth, right, w- despite its biggest factory. So, I mean, their execution in this macro environment has actually been uh, been fascinatingly good, right? Um, yeah. and part of that is just in there in that different S-curve where, they're not in a mature market, whereas a lot of these other companies, you know, the big names, they generate a lot of free cash flow, but they're in a very mature market with their, you know, uh, where um, unless the sort of the market is expanding, so that, and that is driven by consumers to a large extent or businesses, um, then, you know, they have to fight with each other to get that share, right? That's so, right. Um, so like in the advertising market, for example, right, you know, Snapchat was growing a lot until, um, you know, until the budgets until got pulled, when the budgets <laughs> <laughs> until the budgets got pulled and snap snapped because you know it now yeah. had to fight for those extra dollars which are going to I guess Alphabet and Meta. Yeah. Um, so, but that problem actually, you know, Tesla can just keep eating the share of the ice makers uh, that's right. for for a long, long time, and and that's an advantage. And, and they're such a smart company. I was going to ask you this: Do you think? I mean. Uh, so you you mentioned this uh, sort of indirectly, and again, if you don't want to talk about this, that's fine. Do you think geopolitical tension, uh, because you you hinted at you know sort of um, you know onshoring of capacities and things like that, right? So the global supply chain. Do you think geopolitical tension is one of the biggest risks uh, to to Tesla? So I I think so only because I don't understand it that well. That's why I view it as a risk for myself. Because I, it's so hard to um, predict what the hell is going to happen here in the next year or two with the stuff that's going on, that there has to be something in there that's going to impact Tesla's ability to. So for I'll, I'll do the China Taiwan thing as an example. So mm-hmm. you have Nancy Pelosi going there, I think tomorrow, right? And China saying that, hey, listen, like this is not cool, like this is going to be a problem, and the U.S. is like, screw you, I'm going to go anyway. China has a has a really good relationship with Tesla, which is an American car company. But what if that uh, relationship with the U.S. really goes super sour? What happens to Tesla's ability to run in China now, right? So China right, right now is half of its half of its uh, production capacity, roughly, before Austin and Berlin ramp. Once those two ramp, it's about a fourth. But that's still a fourth of of uh, Tesla's production. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happens there. Do they cut off the supply chain and say, "Sorry, you're an American car company. We can't send you any anything else anymore. You're going to have to figure out how to get your own parts from mm-hmm. America." I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what happens there, right? So that's that's one thing that that's going on there. Uh, then you have sort of the complexities around Russia and Ukraine and the winter coming up, and I don't know what's going to happen there. How is that going to impact the European economy, which is probably like I don't know, 10, 10 to fifteen percent of Tesla's total demand, if I were to guess. So that's yet another impact. So if China goes away and then Europe goes away, that's you know that's thirty thirty five percent. Uh, maybe even 40% of Tesla's demand is somehow impacted, call it in the near term. But the the fact that I don't know what's going to happen is what flags it as a risk for me. Now, fast forward five to 10 years from now, will Tesla have figured out how to navigate that environment? Absolutely, because they have the cash and they have the leader and they have the talent and they have the will, right? So they would have figured this out, but it's still a risk. It's still a risk. Is it a likely risk? I don't know. I don't know. I would put it maybe like a, of a chance of it making some sort of negative impact to Tesla in the near term, I don't know, maybe five, ten percent. Because you know, you think about well, China does it, do they really have leverage to do this whole Taiwan thing? I don't know because they have a whole housing crisis going on right now that you know that they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. So are they really in a position to ruffle some feathers? I don't know. Like there's just so much crap going on <laughs> that's right. sort of been has yeah. picked off with this Russia Ukraine war. That um, I don't know. There's a lot of question marks. But if there's a company that can navigate through it, it's Tesla. Excellent. I, I think I agree with that. Okay, I'm going to ask you something different uh, as a last question, which is sure. we didn't talk about this at all uh, today, which is, I think, very interesting. Uh, we're talking about Tesla, we talked about cars, we talked about self driving, we talked about Dojo, we talked about AI. We didn't talk about Tesla energy at all, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> no one does. I mean, it's like the forgotten uh, child. It's you know? the forgotten. <laughs> I've got two power walls at home, and I've got, I've actually got Tesla's electricity plan because uh, I'm part of a virtual power plant uh, here in New South Wales. Um, it, it, and I think that's one of the most fascinating things that they're going um, is the ability to completely change this very arcane setup we have from, you know, 100 years ago uh, called the electricity grid, right? Um, yeah. Now, what do you think about that? <laughs> 
if you had any talk thoughts. about i do talk about the mother of all catalysts right so no one's not even in the tesla community we're talking about this that's exactly. that's how like that's how little we are giving value to this thing and that's and that's and i think it's because for this is one of elon so if you give him like a negative point here is that he's been hyping up energy a lot and it, and it keeps getting sort of delayed in impact because of how much supply they have to move to the auto division right so yeah that's one thing that elon hasn't done very well is, is sort of like create expectations around energy and actually execute it against them so that i would give him one negative there and he knows this and everybody at tesla knows this like okay it is what it is like it i understand that it's you got to get the supply it's a, it's an impossible thing to grow both at the same time got it but the the long-term impact so the fact that you're a customer who it, has been able to feel how impactful this technology is speaks volumes to how valuable a technology like this exists and who else is doing this no one nobody is even close to not only be able to execute on this thing but to have the supply chain to really scale this again, across the whole world. Now, Tesla has to the, decide to, at some point, start moving supply from the auto business to the energy business so they can start making this happen at a larger scale. Um, but at that point will come, you know, that point will come. And I'm, and I'm curious to see how much of Master Plan Part 3, so those that are not familiar, Master Plan Part 3 is, uh, you know, every, every like five to 10 years, Elon has put out a master plan for Tesla, which outlines like four or five key driving principles for the company. That what they're going to do for the next five to 10 years, call it. And he's sort of been hyping up master plan part three, which I, I'm guessing will be related uh, or he talked about, sorry, he specifically said it's going to be a scaling is going to be uh, getting uh, Tesla to crazy scalability. And my prediction is that he'll unveil it in about two, three days at the investor meeting on Thursday in August of this year. So, uh, and I think that's going to give us true insight into what energy actually means for the next say five to 10 years for Tesla. Um, it's, it's a gigantic catalyst. It's yet another uh, FCF monster that's going to be added to the portfolio. And uh, the fact that no one's talking about it, even in our uh, communities, tells me that there's going to be one of these quarters where we're all going to look at the earnings and we're going to be like, where the hell did these $2 billion come from? And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, we ramped it energy. And we're going to be like, okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, we're going to add another $100 billion in the next four quarters. Cool. That's great. So I, that's what, probably what's going to happen you know, uh, in, in Tesla fashion. So incredibly excited for it. I have no idea when it's going to happen, but it's, it's one of those very, very not known things that are going to, again, change the story, change the story yet again. Farzad, thank you for speaking with me. It was fascinating. And uh, yeah, and I look forward to this getting, you know, transcribed and then posted uh, for people to listen. I'll, I'll send you the link when it's done and we'll, we'll share it on, on social media. Awesome, man. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate you having me.